We are thrilled to be continuing our ecological theme this week as we talk with Dutch fibre artist Jeanette Lenditzer as she takes us on a beachcombing adventure. Born in the Netherlands, growing up on the Dutch shore, Jeanette's fibre work now responds to the rugged coast of Maine in the United States, where she finds sculptural forms in the landscape and its creatures. Exploring the concept of belonging, she has developed a body of work that amalgamates with this marine environment. Jeanette's body of work builds upon ancient fibre techniques from felting and shibori to basket weaving, growing out of experimentation and manipulation. From the vulnerable, delicate, fragile vessels to the biomimicry of her pleated silk sculptures, it's clear to see Jeanette has a deep appreciation and affection for nature. Her current work uses the living construction material seaweed, tightly sewn and coiled with linen thread, to create astonishingly sculptural vessels. Her rockweed vessels reveal the beauty of these ancient algae, while drawing attention to its environmental value. It's hard to believe Jeanette has only been creating these vessels for little over 18 months. After receiving a Bachelor of Arts with Honours in Graphic Design at the Academy of Art and Design St. Just in the Netherlands, Jeanette was a book designer for many years, winning both national and international awards. In 2016, she returned to Fibre, where her work was selected by Fibre Art Now for the Excellence in Fibre's juried exhibition and appeared on the winter issue cover of the magazine. Her accessories have been featured in the Boston's Museum of Fine Arts gift collection and can be found at the Society of Arts and Crafts Boston and Artful Home. They are also offered at the Textile Museum in the Netherlands. Jeanette has exhibited in a number of group exhibitions, including recently the Cahoon Museum of American Art Interwoven Contemporary Basketry. It is a great honour to talk with Jeanette today, all the way from Minnesota in the United States. If you're joining in live, please let us know where you are in the world. And if you have a question or comment for Jeanette, simply pop it in the comments. So without further ado, we welcome our 55th Friday feature artist, Jeanette Lendese. I hope I got your name even remotely right. I was practicing really hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's perfect. You you did a great job, and and thank you for this wonderful uh, introduction. Beautifully done. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's just such a treat. Um, we were, we're certainly not alone. We've got lots of people watching, and I love that people say hello. So please, yeah, say hello to Jeanette. It's so wonderful. Hi, Maniqua. Lovely from Sweden. That's Hello, Sweden. Thank you. Yeah. Miranda from Melbourne. And we were just saying behind the scenes that um, it's great, this time zone, because you get all, all continents, basically. This is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the Netherlands. Oh. <laughs> oh, um, currently nowhere in the Netherlands. I did have some people in a, some work in a museum shop at one point at the uh, Textile Museum in Tilburg, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so nice that you've got someone from the Netherlands watching yeah. that. It's great. Feel free to ask lots of questions. I'm sure they'll um, have heaps from Greece, from the UK. Hi, Diane. Oh, hi, Fiona. Fiona's a beautiful basket weaver. Oh, from Ireland. Gorgeous. Oh, wonderful. From Vancouver. I hope you're not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> actually, wonderful. you know yeah. what? Seeing people's beautiful faces and comments actually makes me less nervous. I just go, oh, that is so nice. So um, even Julie from the Gold Coast, I think, oh, I got you, didn't I, Julie? That's great. Wonderful. So, Jeanette. We've got lots to talk about today, and I certainly want to showcase your beautiful work. But I wanted to start at the beginning, and I feel like anything that you turn your hand to, you'll make a success of, going off the brief <laughs> descriptions and videos that I've, I've done some research on. You were once an internationally awarded book designer. How did you go from graphic design and book design and all those awards to fibre? I'd love to hear about your journey into it. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I 
ended up studying graphic design. Um, I always had an interest in textiles, but I think I ended up studying graphic design because it seemed like a kind of a, a practical choice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you do that first year in art school and you, you get to put your hands on all kinds of different materials. And um, I loved photography. I loved design. I, I actually loved so many uh, things that I did there, but it seemed like graphic design. I could see myself uh, make a living doing it. So that, that definitely went into it. Uh, um, mm. You know, coming from a, a working class background, I think uh, just choosing a practical direction was definitely on my mind. Uh, I think once I came to New York City for an internship, uh, I was just like, oh, wow, I could have done this. You know, I could have been a costume designer. I could have been a, you know, I don't know. There, there seemed to be so many more possibilities there that I I, I, I guess I, I was not aware of before. Um, but I had loved my career in books. I, I had a wonderful start at the, uh, at the MIT Press Design Department and yeah. great art directors and... Uh, you know, loved, uh, I, I have always loved making, working with the author and learning more about uh, the book that you're actually making. So you, you learn, uh, you know, about so many different subject matters because you sort of have to immerse yourself a little bit, you know, in the material before so that you can make a good book. And so that was, you know, very exciting for a very long time. And um, it, it's only been in the, you know, last number of years that I started thinking, oh, I think I think I need something new to feel as excited again as I used to about creating new things. I think every every artist has this. Um, you know, I think we do it because you make something and you just get so excited or you, you get an idea and you're so excited. And, and I was feeling that that was lessening uh, mm -hmm. as I was designing books. And so I, I, I felt I needed fresh materials, I guess, to sort of get re-inspired. Yeah. 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 And how has your Dutch heritage influenced your fibre work? Well, you know, well, there's the influence of the ocean, you know, growing up near the ocean, I think. Um, so it goes back to when I was like, you know, pretty small and, and uh, would spend time in the summer with my family um, there and um, just, you know, beach combing, uh, tidal pools, all these things that kids love to do on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, design-wise and culturally, I think, you know, the Netherlands has a, has a great art and design culture. And, and so, you know, I, I certainly, I think I brought that with me too. I think sort of the love for minimalism, I guess, and the love of stripping things down to their, I don't know, essence, I think that's you see that a lot in Northern European art and design. So I think there's some of that, that yeah. I, you know, that I, yeah. that sort of has creeps, is in my work just because of what you've been seeing all your life. Yeah. 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 So, and your work is so very minimalistic. It's, it's gorgeous. I would love to show people um, some of your earlier work before we get onto your seaweed vessels, which I know so many people are hanging out for, so I'm going to make them wait, <laughs> um, including um, we've got beautiful Harriet here. And I have to give Harriet a shout-out because she actually recommended you to us, um, Jeanette. So thank you so much, Harriet. Um, you've thank got you. an eye. You've got an eye, that's for sure. <laughs> um, uh, oh, thank you, Kathy. She says lovely questions. It's great to be reminded that the whole person and their history is brought to the making. Yeah. Definitely. definitely. And I thought that that was interesting as well, that your really early work with those ruffs around the, the neck and sort of uh, that's quite featured heavily in 17th century. Dutch, right. Dutch yeah. yeah. I don't know a lot the of it. The golden age, yeah, yeah. The, you know, 
you were all made aware of these famous paintings and you know yes. everybody was wearing them <laughs> yeah. yeah i'll yeah. show a quick image of of the one that was featured on fiber art now this this beautiful pleated and is that felting or is that silk yeah no it is it is a uh, felt that i kind of made myself uh with by using alpaca because originally I had made uh, felted cows with existing wool felt. Yeah. But that was just, they were so, they were scratchy. And so I started looking for a softer felt, but uh, that's didn't really hold the pleat as well as I wanted it to. So I, the only solution really was to learn how to felt and to make my own felt. So, um, uh, I took a felting class, and so so the cows that I ended up making are basically a, uh, a very stiff organza that is felted on the, both sides with a very soft alpaca. So then you have mm -hmm. this combination of sharp pleats with this very soft layer on top. And I worked with a local alpaca farmer here in Massachusetts who's actually also Dutch. Her name is Karen Borgstein, and she has a amazing alpaca farm she she delivers uh the most high quality alpaca I've, I've ever seen and she so it was fun to work together as a as two dutch people in the u.s <laughs> oh yeah beautiful and then that did the wearables then move on to your like more of the sculptural side of things yeah yeah i would i took them to the shore basically to photograph yeah. And then you know you start sort of you sort of sort of putting them out there and and you just you know you start shaping them and and putting them in the landscape and yeah so from one it sort of went from one thing to the next I felt that when I photographed them there I got new ideas so you know it's this sort of interaction with the landscape that. And then I was thinking, oh, maybe I just don't, I don't want to make wearables. I just, I just want to make, you know, sculptures. So it's, yeah, it's, it, was, yeah, it's sort I, of an organic process. It was an organic process. Yeah. Yeah. You've obviously always had that deep affinity with nature and, and specifically the coastline. And I was going to ask you, did, did that come into your work organically or was that a, like as you were just saying, was it more uh, serendipitous? Like you were just you were making wearables, and then you were at the beach, and then you went, "Wow!" and it sort of hit you, or was it more of a conscious decision? It it, it happened naturally, I think. I mean, two things were happening at the same time. So we we had the summer, we have a summer cottage in this area and so um and we ended up there i think because uh because it it reminds me in so many ways of where i come from in a sense that you know just the smells and the you know s s some of the vegetation certainly also is the same um but um i can't say that um yeah, it, it sort of grew organically, I guess. Just making things, displaying them, then coming home and thinking, oh, you know, I saw this or this color, I can change, or it looks good with this texture. And so, and so you, you, yeah, I don't know, you just sort of pull that into the thing that you do next. So, yeah. 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 And your photography is absolutely beautiful. I love anything photographed in nature. I think it's gorgeous, especially artwork. Was that a conscious decision or something that just happened, um, again, organically? Yeah, no, it happened organically. I mean, at, at first, clearly, it was a decision. Like, okay, I have these scarves. I want to put them on my website. So maybe I'll take them into nature and I'll, I'll photograph them there. And then from, from there, I was just like, Oh, I love I love doing this, and I love seeing it in this context. And then the work started changing because of uh, you know what I saw uh, yeah. when I went into nature. So yeah, it was it was an organic organic process, I would say. I love this one. This is one of my favorites. That the blue 
Chibori, it's absolutely beautiful with that sky. I um, yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. I think photography plays such a huge part in in how you present your work, and you've done it so beautifully. Thank um, you. Yeah, so some of those that you showed are wearables, and others were just sort of little experiments or tests that I did, uh, where I thought they might become a wearable or not, or you know, so. Um, so it's a mix, a mix of things there, yeah. Talk to us about your series of gorgeous, delicate vessels called Fragile. They're absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful as well, and you just feel like they just melt away if a wave hit them. Yeah. Yeah, I sort of started uh, just shaping um, materials. Well, this is actually uh, what you're showing right now is old man's beard. So it's oh. something that grows on the trees. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's, it's not the official Latin name for it, but it's, it's, uh, um, you know, I just sort of gathered it and was like, okay, what, what can I do with that? And, uh, I ended just sort of pressing it in, into this form and, um, I, I use, um, something to, it's not quite a glue. It's well, actually, it's a bookmaking glue in a way, and it's it's water soluble. So I like this idea of making uh, a vessel that grew out of nature and that you could also dissolve again. I was sort of yeah. thinking a lot about, you know, what do we leave behind, and and. Um, you know, I started out trying to use local alpaca in, in trying to become more conscious of, 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 you know, the impact of my work on, you know, on the environment. And then I started thinking about flax and linen because clearly those are better materials to use from an environmental point of view. And then I started using materials that were around me like that old man's beard. This is flax that you're showing right now and some, some, um, yeah, flax fibers mostly, yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. I want to get onto the seaweed because I know everyone's itching. They're going, ah, oh, the seaweed. <laughs> yeah. It's a natural progression. So you're looking to be more sustainable in your work to use materials that can be returned to nature. I mean, it, it's a given, isn't it, that you're going to come across, across seaweed. Talk us through that journey, Jeanette. Well, there's just so much of it on the on the main coast. I mean, because I think uh, the tidal zone is so large, because the, the difference between high and low tide is so big, you have a huge um, intertidal zone. And so um, some of them, some of the areas just have tons of, of rock wheat on them. And it can be sometimes, you know, like a foot thick, you know, in terms of um, layers. And uh, I, I kept on thinking, like, what can I do with it? Because it really catches your eye because in the spring, it, it, it's a fresh green. And then in the fall, it, it turns into this golden color that you just uh, showed in the, in the previous picture. And so you, I was thinking, what can I do? What can I do with it? And I actually took some of it home and tried to preserve it. I had read about some recipes, you know, where you use glycerin and alcohol and, and I, it was just this, it still, it stayed sort of sticky and stinky. I didn't like it. And so I gave up on, on the whole idea for a while. And then, um, yeah, one day I, I walked on the beach and I saw this sort of bunch of seaweed that was blown into a, like a nest like type of shape um by the wind and and all of a sudden I was just like wow this has some integrity uh, you know what if this was stitched together when it was still wet then you know in its dry form it it, it might actually hold together so so mm -hmm. I took some home and I just stitched it and then I was just like I don't have to really do anything I can just stitch it wet and dry it and it, that doesn't need to be more complicated than that so yeah yeah and then you just began it began from there yeah so, yeah 
What are some of the challenges with working with seaweed? Well, it's salty and cold and wet. <laughs> so, uh, my hands some days don't look so good. You know, they they get sort of, um, it's hard on the skin. Um, yeah. And um, so I'm using lots and lots of lotion, I guess. Um, <laughs> the, the, other, the other thing is that you need to keep it cold because um, if you don't keep the seaweed cold, it clearly starts to disintegrate and um so i i keep what i forage in containers of seawater that i cool in a in a big cooler and i keep everything wet and cold until it, also the, the piece that i'm working on until it's until it's finished and then i i dry it all at once um so that at no time you get any um you know decomposing going on because that's where it gets smelly yeah. yeah yeah and keep it wet and wrapped in towels that are drenched in salt water so it's not fresh water is it it's it's all salt like keep it salty keep it yeah I, I you know I don't even know for a fact that maybe if I omitted the salt um it would still be okay but I'm thinking this is its natural environment and I think also salt has a, a preserving kind of a quality to it, right? So yeah, I think it makes sense to just keep it in the salt water. I also think, you know, yeah, I, I think maybe it will affect the the fiber quality if you if you if you you know if you would put it in sweet water. I'm not sure, but that's a feeling I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you're working on your vessels. I would imagine they're very soft and pliable. How do you, when you're stitching, how do you, do you have an end result in mind, like an end shape in mind, or do you have to let the seaweed take it you where it wants to go? It's a little bit of both. Um, mm. I usually do have a shape in mind. It doesn't always do what I want to do. Um, mm. I'm getting better at controlling it and it but it's this neat tension I find between um trying to control you know controlling it and not controlling it because sometimes more beautiful forms uh happen when you don't try to control it all that much so so there's still a lot of surprises there um you know one good thing about having this sort of very flexible shape in the end is that you, that when I dry it, if, if I don't like it, I can basically make the whole vessel wet again and I can redry it a different way. And there's certainly, um, I recently worked on a basket that I actually dried multiple times. So I, I, I would dry, I would go nah, and then I would, put it in a bucket of salt water again, take it out the next day, reshape it, dry it again. I, I think I did that one. I did not this particular one, but some of them I've dried several times. Yeah. 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 That's fascinating because um, my understanding is like traditional basket weaving, you you cut, your, you harvest your materials and you have to take all the moisture out of them first before you, like you so say, you dry them and then you re-wet them and then you work, work on them. But this, it's like, no, you keep, it's the opposite. You keep it wet, keep it wet, keep it wet, dry it, wet it again, see, and then you change it. It, it sounds like a fascinating material to work with. Um, obviously yeah, you could, have, hmm. yeah, yeah, I think you could probably dry all the seaweed uh, that I, you would forage, uh, but then, then you have this huge clump of intertwined, you know, tangled clump, I'm thinking, that you yeah. then would carefully have to wet again. So to me, it makes more sense to just keep everything, to keep everything wet uh, until it's it's in a more organized form of a basket. But uh, you could probably, yeah, you could probably dry it and then, and then we wet it. But you, you probably would damage a lot more of the material because it does get a bit fragile, you know, when it, when it's, the individual strands get fragile when they dry. 
Yeah, the integrity of the structure. Right. Be compromised. Yeah. yeah. What if what are your two I noticed there's two different techniques that you use. There's mm -hmm. kind of one where they like I would call it coiling. Would you refer yeah. to it as coiling? Yeah, I mean both the both techniques that I use are coil are coiling, but in one if you imagine the seaweed branches as like ribbons, you know, with little bubbles in it. Then um, sometimes I, you know, I I stitch it like this, you know, if, if this is the ribbon, I stitch it flat on top of one another and I stitch it on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, and other times I stitch it, you know, imagine the ribbon, the thin side of the ribbon uh, on top of one another uh, and I stitch it on the outside. So, you, so in one of the... I think they really express themselves in different ways because the one technique, you know, you, you, you're more aware of the stitching and in the other technique, you, you're just more aware of the sort of the un, undulating forms, I would say that, mm. that um, are created naturally. Yeah. I would imagine st stitching a really large vessel on the inside would be quite challenging as you. Yeah. You want to keep it clearly. It needs to stay wide enough so that you can, get in there <laughs> yeah um, um but you si since it is flexible you know theoretically you can almost sort of turn it inside out not quite but it's flexible oh, you know, yeah. so to think of it as what you know, like as if you were making a rubber basket or something you know if you had rubber string it's sort of like that it feels quite rubbery when it's wet yeah yeah, yeah. um Everyone's loving it. So um, thank you so much. Um, they're just saying how amazing it is. And, yeah, Chrissy Day is loving the, that love the shibori as well. We do, do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, our friend Ford, uh, sorry, Philip Ford has asked, do the materials that you use ch um, charge because of la or change because of landscape textures that you encounter? Um, so I think refer that was came up sort of referring back to more of your silk shibori. Like um, it, obviously when the photographs, they were photographed, it looked like you'd, you'd done some mimicry obviously um, of the, was that the case or was it that you made it instinctively and then placed it and thought, oh, this is where it belongs? Yeah, no, I, I, there's definitely a back and forth because, you know, I would put this pleated object you know, among the seaweed and you, you know, and then you see all these little nubby things that are part of the seaweed and you go, Ooh, you know, that that's such a nice texture. Like, how can I, what can I do? And so, um, so I would start uh, stitching on my uh, silk before I would pleat it. And then, you know, in pleating, the stitching became nubby and so so yeah there is a constant sort of back and forth between um you know what 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 you see in your photograph and what I saw in my photographs what I liked about them and then trying to pull that back into the work and then taking the work back out there again and so it's sort of this I see it as an, an ongoing sort of dialogue yeah yeah lots of people are asking about the thread that you use so what thread and fiber are you using and how do you get, stitch it together? <laughs> yeah, I use a, a waxed linen uh, and I use a very fine, the finest waxed linen that I, I that's I think out there. And um, I do extra wax that sort of, I have this big clump of beeswax sitting on my uh, work table and I just sort of run the thread, the wax linen over that, uh, before I, I start stitching. So, so it has an extra layer on it because first of all, it helps, you know, with tangling, but it also, I feel the wax sort of just grips the, the seaweed in a way. Sometimes it feels like I'm making sutures, you know, cause it's, it's sort of this live material. It feels almost leather like or skin like or, and, and, yeah. the, and the waxed linen really, um holds it somehow yeah yeah fascinating 
it, it tears it tears less you know if you if you would use like a very thin uh, thread I think you might tear through it more easily yes yeah. yeah yeah I could imagine yeah what kind of needle do you prefer to use um Sylvie's asked do you use a curved needle I, I have not used a curved needle. I tried that for the where I stitch on the inside of the basket, but I, I maybe I just haven't ha found the right way to use it yet. But I it was not so successful. Um, I use um, um, some millinery. What is it called? Millinery needles. The the hat making needles. Yeah, millinery. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I like. Um, yeah, I, I, I try to find a needle with um, where the eye is not bigger than the needle itself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the hole that I have to poke in the seaweed is as, as, as tiny as it can possibly be. So, um, so I don't use needles with a big eye. Yeah. A very fine needle. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to show a couple of your inside details of the baskets as well. I think they're just as beautiful as the outside. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanted to mention to people that one thing that I sort of floored me was that you've only been doing this for 18 months mm -hmm. um, and you've already had uh, like exhibitions with it. And it, it just feels like you've just been propelled into this world of, oh my God. Like, <laughs> Yeah, cultural uh, seaweed vessels. How how are you coping? <laughs> are you <laughs> As I said, I'm I'm using a lot of hand lotion at the moment because, <laughs> and I I uh, tape, I I've, I've come to tape some of my fingers with tape before I started uh, start sewing because you know your fingertips sort of get perforated over time, together mm -hmm. with the salt water. Not so nice, but um. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think COVID helped. I mean, in a strange way, uh, you know, you're not really, you didn't really go to many places. And, and this sort of stitching, I found it very meditative and um, listened to a lot of music, listened to a lot of books. Uh, yeah. it, it definitely helped get through these past two years. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. And it, and it sort of came about as well. You were saying earlier, um, might have been offline, we were talking about your family moving in during that time and your grandson came yes. to see you. And, and you, so you were doing a lot of dyeing and different types of techniques in the in the family kitchen. That's right. And having your grandchild move in sort of made you rethink that process to something a little bit more natural. Yeah, I was already mm -hmm. looking for more natural materials, but I definitely mm -hmm. uh, put my whole silk, a dying uh, you know, sort of on hold uh, yeah. it involved these pleated uh, projects involved you know large pots of boiling liquid on the stove and it just didn't feel it doesn't feel yeah it didn't feel safe in any yeah, way. Us, more of us were using the kitchen so it was just not practical yeah. um, so yeah, I definitely want to go back to some of my pleating work. And I, um, as I mentioned to you privately earlier, I'm uh, building, we're building a, a bigger workspace in Maine and, and I have, uh, a I will have a tiny dye kitchen in that, um, in that new studio. And that, and that will make it a lot easier, um, you know, just to not feel as conscious about whatever you're doing in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well... Um, yeah, I can't wait to see what, what comes out of your new studio when you are close to Maine. And this is an image. My dog's going crazy. Apologies. Um, <laughs> it's distracted me. This is the inside of one of your beautiful vessels. It's just stunning. I wanted to ask you about the colour shifts that you, you get with, with working with seaweed and how that changes over the drying process. Yeah, it's still definitely an area that I'm uh, still learning. Um, um, initially, it seems like every vessel just dries mostly black. And then over time, 
uh, as it ages. Uh, some of them go more towards the brown, uh, some of them go more towards the green. Um, I'm, some people tell me, you know, it's if you expose it to more light, then you get the reds. If you expose it to less light, so if it dries in the sh more shadowy space, you're going to get greens. Um, I, I need to get more scientific about it, I think, to, to really uh, understand exactly uh, what's, what's happening. Um, but there's so many variables, you know, you, some of the seaweed is harvested in spring, some of it in the summer, some of it in the winter. Mm -hmm. You dry it in different ways, you, yeah. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure all of that out. I, I do love the different shades that you get, especially the, the sort of the rust and reddish oh, shades. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think I have an image to, to display that, but I'm sure people understand, like they've seen that red, red kelpie seed. Yeah, they call it sun bleaching, actually. It's, 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 you know, yeah. yeah. The sun bleaching, yeah. Well, that'll be fascinating to see when you start getting, um, yeah, start doing your scientific experiments about right. harvesting and right. seaweeds and what have, what have you learned about harvesting? And I'm sure there is going to be so many people out here inspired watching this thinking, I'm going to go to the shore and I'm going to harvest seaweed and make gorgeous vessels. And that's fantastic. But what can advice can you give people about responsible harvesting of seaweed? Yeah, yeah I think that's a very important part uh, or important thing to talk about because, um I forage in an area where there's just so, so much of it. Um, and still I try to be just extremely careful about, you know, how much I take and where I take it. I try to um, forage just in, in, in areas that are already getting a bunch of traffic. So maybe near a public dock or places like that. Uh, I try to leave the more the the natural the more natural areas uh, undisturbed. Um, I I order just I or I forage just a couple of uh, branches from each plant, uh, so from each algae, so it can recover. Uh, I leave just as, as as if you would prune a perennial. Uh, they recommend leaving uh, at least 16 inches of the, um, the branch intact. Um, so, so don't, you know, never remove it at its root, but, you know, use the top part of the, of the algae to, mm -hmm. to work with. Yeah. Um, th that way it can regenerate easily. Yeah. Because, it provides uh, an, an amazing habitat, you know, both at low tide and at high tide. I mean, at, at, at low tide, so many creatures can stay moist within the seaweed and that's how they survive. And, and uh, birds find food among it and, you know, and at low t and at high tide, it's, it, it forms this underwater forest, you know, and, 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 mm -hmm. It's a whole other habitat for uh, fish and, um, yeah, lots of creatures, yeah. How can we tell the age of rockweed? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a very, it was one of the most interesting things I learned, that you, if you look at the algae, um, you know, you have these vesicles, so that these are sort of these air bladders that, actually hold up the seaweed uh, when it's in the, in, in the water. So it makes, it helps it stand upright. And if you pick one, the, like the main branch and you, and you count the vesicles, um, you know, that tells you how, how many, how old the plant is because every year, basically the plant makes a new, or the algae makes, makes a new vesicle. Um, yeah yeah that's fantastic so sort of like yeah counting rings on a tree uh, clearly it's not always 100 percent accurate because the ocean might uh, take a part of it you know mm -hmm. if, if you have a pretty heavy duty storm uh, a, a chunk of it can break off um, 
but sort of generally speaking in a, in a, in a calmer part of the coast or an area that's less exposed to storms, you, you can, yeah, you can roughly count, uh, figure out how old they are. And it's amazing how old they can get. I mean, I would, yeah, I see sometimes up to like 15 of these fascicles on one, on one algae. Oh, wow. Yeah, it really puts it into perspective, doesn't it, that it's 15, you know, years old and it's growing, you know, this this much, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. so I think, I mean, people have used rock wheat for ages. I mean, people harvest it to put it on their little uh, garden plot, you know. Mm. It's, it's great to, it's a great fertilizer and, and people use it, you know, to, for a clam bake to add flavor or even uh, to pack lobsters, live lobsters, you know, you can sort of like live bubble wrap in a way, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so people have always used it and uh, mm. I think there's plenty of it to do that, but I think, you know, more and more, um, companies are, are, are beginning to see it as a commodity and it's harvested on a larger scale sometimes. Um, um, I, I think we just need to be aware uh, and, and, and not make the same mistake that we made uh, with the rainforest so that we just, you know, treat it with respect, you know, give it a chance to grow back. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's very, um, very wise words. And we've got a couple of questions, but before before I um, go to the questions, there's I just wanted to pop the the link up to the main rockweed um, co coalition. So yeah. that's um, there to help protect the rockweed. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I became aware of them. I, I um, as I was trying to inform myself about seaweed, um, I sort of joined this colloquy on on rockweed or on seaweed it was on all seaweeds and and uh, she was a part of it and um yeah she she uh is work, working really hard to make sure that people are aware of the organization i should say is working pretty hard to make people aware of of uh of the importance of rockweed and and mm -hmm. uh, you know that yeah, she 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 studied it, the subject pretty deeply, and and saw the damage that is being done by commercial harvesting, and mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so their mission is to um, create awareness and yeah, mm -hmm. make sure that yeah we do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. And Phillips asked, have you tried other seaweeds other than the bladder rack? Um, he calls it, would it be possible to applique pieces of kelp or nori into your baskets? Yeah, I mean, I have tried um, to use some kelp. Um, I, it, it is very fragile uh, once it's dry. So um, I, I have found that you can cut the sections of kelp um, that where the the eggs of the kelp are formed, the egg cells, um, that that is sort of a double layer, and so that is stronger. So I'm sort of uh, looking into that or exploring that. Um, I've used some of the stems of kelp for handles uh, on some of my baskets. I definitely, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I keep looking. I mean, and thinking and gathering and trying so who knows what what other seaweeds might uh, find their way into my work um, yeah but I think rockweed has this particularly leathery quality that lends itself to to what I'm doing right now um, whereas many seaweeds they're once you dry them there's you know, they're so incredibly thin and fragile. Yes. We would have to sort of um, use maybe other materials to make them strong enough or, or and I, I'm trying to keep it all as natural as possible. So, so to not use any artificial or plasticky or, or strengthening um, layers, so to speak, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Harriet asked, "Do you, your photography and backgrounds are stunning? Um, do you use a DSLR camera, camera, and have any special equipment or tips for shooting outdoors or indoors?" <laughs> I have now. Now have to make a, a big confession that I use only my iPhone for <laughs> all of this. I shoot everything with my phone. Yeah, um, I think I think a lot of it is about looking. I I often take many, many photographs of the same thing at all different angles and I walk around it and I, 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 you know, you lay on the ground, you stand on your tippy toes, you, you look at it from all diff in all different ways. And then, mm. um, you know, I think maybe some of it goes back to having uh, worked as a graphic designer for so long so that you're, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a lot, of, you know, you think about cropping and framing a lot. Uh, yeah. So maybe that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I love how you've matched your backgrounds as well, like the gorgeous grey. I'll try and pull up an image here. Um, you know, your gorgeous textural grey, it almost looks like it's sitting on concrete. So it's quite industrial feel to these yeah. ones. Yeah, um, this is this is like if you I mean I've worked with I've tried so many different materials so I have to admit I have a an attic full of like all kinds of fabrics and and just remnants of all kinds of materials and so yeah you know I just like pulled them out this is a black this is a felt actually um sort of a heather felt that I used as a background yeah yeah, and what I love about it is, like, the luster that you get. It just does look like polished leather, doesn't it? It's just stunning. Is that this one here completely dry? Uh, this one is sort of a little bit in between. It's it's mm -hmm. starting to dry, but um, it would turn quite a bit more lacy, you know, once mm -hmm. it's completely fully dried. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I wish I could keep them like this for a little bit longer. Um Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can imagine. Yeah. Tell us about the Future Materials Bank because I've never heard of it before and I just thought, wow, I'm sure there's a lot of people watching here that would uh, like to be more sustainable in their craft. Yeah, um, definitely. That's definitely a link to check out. Uh, I, I didn't know it existed either. Um, the uh, one of the persons who is managing it uh, approached me um, via Instagram, you know, the miracles of Instagram. Um, mm. And it's a collaboration between the Jan van Eyck uh, Art Academy in the Netherlands. And it's called, and it, uh, the Future of Materials Masters Program uh, and from uh, uh, the London Academy of Art, or Central St. Martins of London, I think they're called. And they, um, they co they're collaborating on this um, collection, basically, they're, they're, they're of, of materials that, that are sustainable. And so they, they have them all in this, on this website uh, and show work that has made, has been made with these materials. And, um, yeah, a lot of the materials come out of the our our industry waste stream, or um, so you can find things made with eggshells. You can find things made with, um, you know, glazes made with industrial waste. So um, yeah, so it's a very inspiring site to to visit and to see what can be done with just what's around us or what gets thrown away on a daily basis. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for that. We've put a link up and hopefully people can check it out and get inspired about using not only seaweed, but other, other materials for sure. Um, yeah. Harriet said, yes, that that's awesome about the photography and certainly loves the greys. Um, <laughs> Kathy said, hearing about your process and the back and forth dialogue between the materials, possibilities and ideas, and then the knowledge that grows with practice. Yeah, it is so much in 18 months. You're so right. Um, 
I just, yeah, I'm in awe absolutely as well. And and Philip says, thank you for answering his question. Your work is wonderful. I appreciate that you have a strong sense of placing your pots within a landscape. Yeah. Thank I you. want to talk about your bread basket because <laughs> I feel like your work is just so beautiful and sculptural. And then when I, and it's also fun. You've got a great sense of humour and a great, um, a great oh just the creativity behind this basket can you tell us a little bit about this one and I think it'll change everyone's perception of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean well so Steinbeiser this this organization that uh, puts sort of celebrity chefs together with craftspeople um, is looking for to sort of change the dining experience so um, so when they work with craftspeople, they ask you to sort of come up with a new approach to an everyday utensil that you or or um, dish or glass or whatever it is that you that is being used in dining. And so, um, since I was making baskets, they asked me to do to make a um, a bread basket, and it made me sort of think of the function of the bread basket. I'm like, how can you make that? different or and um and then I was just thinking about the whole experience of going to a, like a restaurant where you you know they put this bread basket in the middle of the table and and usually there's there's not enough bread there and you sort of become really aware in the group of you know am I going to be taking this last piece or are you <laughs> going to take it or you know people are hungry you don't want to be greedy and so I was thinking, maybe we should just make this really awkward gesture of reaching in that central bread basket, just even more awkward and and, oh, more, yes. and more self-conscious by just having to reach through one of these like tubes into the belly of this beast. Into the belly of the beast. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of one of those crazy reality TV shows or something where it's like a challenge and you you don't know what's going to be in there. <laughs> it could be a yeah, crap. You even need the hand of the other person reaching in from the other side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just think it was fantastic. How many of them do you have to make for that project? Um, and how well, are they going to make a series? So I think some of them will only have like two of these tubes and, and some of them will only have one and this one has three. Um, but um, I, I definitely still have a lot of making to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. How long, how long would something like that take you to make? Well, weeks and weeks and weeks. That, that one, that's a big one. And, uh, yeah, it, yeah, probably probably two months of stitching wow. every day. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible, Jeanette. And I don't even want to ask how you begin to price your work on something like that, that such, you know, I mean, for one thing, it's so beautiful. And then the labour involved is just incredible. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I think it's um, absolutely <laughs> stunning. And you've inspired so many people today and around the world. Oh, what, what's next, do you think? What's next for your practice? Um, I'm just going to keep thinking, you know, where these shapes can take me because, um, recently I sort of started thinking more about the vesicles themselves, you know, these air bladders that, um, that are part of the seaweed. And so maybe I, I'm, I'm going to be making larger vesicle type shapes that, could suspend from the ceiling, things like, you know, where you, you can be more among it, like as if you're oh wow within the seaweed. Yeah. So all, um, I don't know if I can ever get this much stitching done, but I think that would that could be beautiful. Uh sort of more in, creating more of an environment yes. to be in. Um, so I, I I'm certainly thinking about that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I, you know, as most creative people, you always have a lot of plans, and then you start making things, and then it just 
can go off in a whole other di direction. <laughs> so I, it's yeah, yeah. it's yeah. sort of it's, for me things just sort of come you know come as they come, and I just try to stay open, I guess, to what happens with the material and and sort of let it take me where yeah. it wants to take me in a way. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I knew it was a silly question to kind of go, well, where are you going next with your work? It's like, well, I'll let the work take me there. I'll just have to let you know when I let you know when I get there, sort of thing. Like it's it's so true. Yeah. 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 Um, Philip said uh, the bread basket could hold baguettes. I could have <laughs> that. Yeah. 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 Giggle. Um, we're going to play a slideshow at the end and pop up everybody's thank you. So start popping your comments in, thanking Jeanette for a wonderful time and knowledge today. And I'll finish off with the last couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, so, Jeanette, you, my understanding is that you've never taught Um your techniques and obviously you're still developing them is that a plan in the future for you um i'd love to um i you know i'm trying to think like how could you turn this into um you know how could you turn it into something that um that people can could then take and and uh, you know sort of go their own way with it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would love that. I would love to think about that more. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely something something to think about. I mean, having a larger studio soon will definitely make that more possible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm also thinking about just inviting other people into my studio just to have that back and forth between... Um, fellow creative people because I think most of us makers are sort of a bit off on an island <laughs> and yeah. I think we can make even more beautiful things when we see each other's work and can sort of exchange ideas so I'm thinking about that too um yeah but yeah I, I I'm definitely open to the idea of teaching uh it's it's there's been so much attention all of a sudden for these seaweed baskets that I'm uh, just currently just trying to make and, and um, yeah, um, yeah, have enough mm. work for these shows. Um, but um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's nice to connect with other people over, over yeah. making. It's the most wonderful thing. So I really uh, I think it's amazing what you do with your no. You know, with your company, you know, yeah, that you mm -hmm. you open these worlds for people and you, you start with mm -hmm. a class and then you go from there, right? And you do, yeah. 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 yeah, it's so beautiful to see some students' names pop up and just to give them more inspiration. We certainly let everyone know in Harriet's group, um, basket weaving group, about today's talk. And um, and I wouldn't have met you if it wasn't for, for Harriet, so I really do. Yeah, many, many thanks, Harriet. I mean... Yeah. A huge yeah. admirer of her work, so it's, it's yeah, yeah, I'm thrilled that <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Well, good luck and good luck with is it Milan Fashion Week? You've even taken seaweed into Milan Fashion Week. It's, that... it's called Design Week. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's um, they uh, are uh, organizing a show that's called Materialized, and so. It is a, it's going to be a joint show of um, artists and craftspeople and designers using um, newer, well, it's not, clearly seaweed is new, not a new material because it's a, <laughs> billions of years old, but people using uh, unusual materials or sustainable materials um, for their work. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. That's supposed to be in June. That show is that design week is in June. Yeah. 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 Well, good luck. Good luck with all that stitching, all that coiling, all the seaweed, all the foraging, all the chili binning. I say chili bin for our New Zealand friends. We call them eskies. You call them cooler boxes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, didn't know, I didn't know that word. So I learned a whole new word today. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Thank you, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk yeah. about my work and, and, and I, wonderful to see so many people have interest in 
yeah um, yeah it is yeah it's so great to see a craftsperson just taking the environment so seriously and taking their craft so seriously and, and yeah um creating such beautiful forms out of it as well so thank you I'm going to play a little exit slideshow and then um, pop up some little notes of gratitude. Everyone's just had a ball today. So uh, thank you. Yeah, and we hope to follow up again in, in a year or so and just see see where you've been, where, where you've taken it next. I, I just. I would love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Me too. That'd be fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. <laughs>